So now we get a presentation from Martin Robards. Martin and Rich, right? Yes. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Martin Robards, who has a case study in the Bering Strait, so we go into the marine system. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and I'm sorry not to be able to be there in Kautokino. Um, I look forward to meeting at the next session. What I'd like to talk about is how we're looking at um, resilience of um, international policies to changing so social ecological systems. And I'm using Arctic shipping as a case study for that. So what I'll do in this presentation is give a little bit of background to Arctic shipping and then look at how we're adapting that to the resilience framework. Global commercial shipping, um, as you can see in this diagram, looking at the intensity of shipping, is all over the world's oceans. Um, the red areas show the main shipping lanes, and the shipping lane you see that runs from Scandinavia on Europe through the Mediterranean, Suez Canal, and across to Asia, is the one that's starting to divert a little bit to the north. It's coming across here, across what's called the Northern Sea Route. And why is that happening? The Northern Sea Route is about 30% shorter than the other, the other route, so it's about a week saving on sailing, which is a huge um, cost benefit for the shipping industry. Not only is the Northern Sea Route opening up, but as you can see in this diagram, the Northern Sea Route being in red, there's also other sea routes that will open up as sea ice becomes less in the Arctic both the Central Arctic Route and the Northwest Passage. The common thing with all of these routes is that if they're going to go to Asia, where a lot of the economic development in the world is happening at the moment, they go through Bering Strait. And Bering Strait is the location of the case study that we're working on. And this really demonstrates why that area is important from an Arctic perspective. So Bering Strait is a narrow area that separates Russia from North America. The strait itself in the north is 85 kilometers wide, and then Arnadir Strait, a little to the south, separating St. Lawrence Island in the United States from Russia, is about 70 kilometers wide. At its narrowest point between the big, the Diomede Islands, Big Diomede and Little Diomede, only four kilometers separate the two countries. The area is incredibly important for marine mammals. Um, in the spring each year as the ice retreats into the Arctic, and, and this is something that's going to continue on um, as long as any of the models are showing right now, the Bering Sea will freeze over every winter. And so as the ice retreats, 13,000 bowhead whales and about 150,000 Pacific walrus and numerous other species of marine mammal move back with that sea ice into the Arctic basin. For the bowhead and the walrus, that is the entire population of that, of that um, specific, specific species. So an incredible aggregation of animals over just a couple of weeks. The same thing happens again in the fall as the sea ice moves back down into the Bering Sea in the south of the diagram here, um, where the entire population of those species are pushed back by the ice to the south. And so it's this aggregation of wildlife that is of concern. Through that region, Indigenous communities have congregated, and you can see here the yellow dots being communities actively engaged in um, subsistence activities with marine, with marine mammals. Incredible concentration of communities. Um, not surprising because, you know, with this being a marine mammal aggregation, the communities have evolved here over time to take advantage of that resource. So with that being said, the increases in Arctic shipping are of great concern. You know, from a policy perspective and from an indigenous food security and from a conservation perspective, and to a point now where The Economist, a well-known U.S. journal, you know, indicated how last year's sailing of the Takhanov, a very large tanker here in the bottom left of the diagram with its attendant icebreaker, um, the red ship to the right, being the largest ship to have crossed the, North, the Northern Sea Route. So, What's going on with the shipping? Is it just one, or is it something that's increasing? We think it's increasing. The in projected increases are for 64 million tons by 2020. When we look at what's going on over the last couple of years, we see 
Now, I'm not sure whether we'll get to 64 million tons, but we're certainly on a rapid increase. Four vessels passed in 2010, 35 this year so far, and indications that it will be over 40 by the end of the season towards the end of November, and already um, a good 10 times increase in the amount of cargo going through the Bering Strait. When we look at the different products that are going through the Bering Strait, I apologize for this slide, it's reformatted here for some reason. Over half of the cargo is petroleum products, and we know from numerous studies now that much less than, much more than drilling, it is during the transportation of petroleum products that we really have to worry about the potential for spills. So we have fuel like diesel, um, products like iron ore going from Scandinavia and Europe across to Asia. But notice in the lower part of this um, list, we also have jet fuel and kerosene going from um, Asia back across to Scandinavia. So a real two-way traffic um, and a lot of products being transported. And all indications are that this is going to rapidly increase over the next decade. So what are we worried about? Firstly, we're worried about direct impacts to things like whales. This is an Atlantic, Atlantic right whale that was hit by a ship. Um, you can see here you know, the devastating impact of something like this. Um, there's obviously more vessels in the Atlantic, um, but we have a lot more whales to get hit in the Pacific. So um, these are the sort of impacts that we're expecting with ships and whales in such close proximity to each other. We're also thinking about wildlife aggregation, a specific walrus, a very important subsistence resource, are coming together in, in very large concentrated numbers on the Russian coast. In this picture, it's Cape Sertsi Carmen, just west of Bering Straits on the Chukotka Peninsula, where over 100,000 walrus have been aggregating about half the world's population on this one area. And then also concerned about impacts of noise from vessels, pollution, and stress um, just being around the vessel noise. And this can shift animals away from their optimal feeding areas. It could shift animals away from communities that rely on them. All of these things come together in affecting indigenous food security um, through a couple of different ways. Either there will be less animals in the environment if they're impacted by Arctic shipping. Um, they may be moved away from communities, so are less, of, less available to a specific community. And then politically, if we lose animals, particularly things like the bowhead whale, those are likely to be taken out of the indigenous subsistence quotas by the International Whaling Commission. So politically, animals may be reduced and, again, affect food security. So bringing this background into the case study, the question I'm really trying to get at with, with the study is what circumstances will allow existing global policies to change in response to the new risks being faced by marine mammals and indigenous peoples in Bering Strait as a result of climate change, industrial development, and these new transportation activities. And the assumption, the thing we're building from, is that the maritime conditions are unique to the Arctic and not conducive to being regulated by pan-Arctic global policy. Shipping is regulated underneath the International Maritime Organization, a generic rulemaking body that governs shipping throughout the entire planet. So is there something special about the Arctic that needs to be put in place that deals with these very specific conditions for marine mammals and indigenous food security? Currently, ships pass through the region under the same top-down generic regulation yeah, as anywhere else in the world. So we have a bit of a policy dilemma here. And so I'm starting to draw now into the, the policy sciences, which is the piece of the puzzle that, that I'm bringing to this, um, what happens in particularly maritime policy is you have to wait for a disaster, this strong perturbation in the system to, to lead to change. And I think you can look at this from um, Seoul as the safety of life at sea perspective. That did not happen until the Titanic sank with huge loss of human life and people rallied around that as a sounding board to move towards new laws that would protect people you know, while they were on vessels. The same thing with the Torrey Canyon ex accident in 1967 when we had huge loss of wildlife from the loss of this oil tanker, which led to the Marine Pollution Act. Again, something you know, that only came after a disaster. So the question at the heart of all of this is, do we need to wait for a disaster or crisis that affects indigenous food security 
before we do something tangible in policy. If we look at Arctic shipping, how would we relate these issues and, and the resilience of policy or the resilience even of the social ecological system with the, so the decision making process in that system? This would be a very easy thing to solve if the International Maritime Organization was working directly with tribes and working directly with marine mammals, but it isn't. The International Maritime Organization works with the Russian Federation and the United States, and those two countries may work you know, within the Arctic Council through um, working groups such as the protection of the Arctic marine environment. But for anything to happen in Bering Strait that puts a special policy to protect for these special circumstances I've talked about, the Russian Federation and the United States must work together in cooperation. They will take their information from uh, um, native groups in the region. The native groups represent their tribes and the tribes may be um, working on stewardship of marine mammals. So that would be the, the link between those elements. But we mustn't forget also that the state of Alaska is involved in this. And also there's a lot of international bodies looking after trade interests and things like freedom of the seas um, or really focused on vessel safety um, and economics. So there's a lot of interest within this. And so rather than keep it at this level that is sort of somewhat complicated, I think we can look at it more like this. We can look at this policy arenas from over different scales from the tribal to the regional to the national and the international. And we can look at how policy responds at these different levels to these new circumstances. When we think of resilience of the actors in, in the social ecological system, so the native groups or people around marine mammals, the communities, is fundamentally related to the ability of policy to respond at multiple scales, these different four scales. The resilience I'm talking about in the case study is more from an engineering perspective than an ecological resilience and draws from quite a lot of literature now within the environmental law and the policy sciences literature um, that the policies governing shipping at, shipping at the international level really allow us to focus on what we can do to allow for more adaptation at the local level, more things that are precautionary, these things that really fit with the resilience mantra. And trying to understand how to improve responsiveness of policy to the new conditions while maintaining a necessary level of stability of the other normative goals, such as vessel safety, is the goal of policy in, in, in this case study. I've drawn this out in a conceptual diagram, which may be the most useful thing for discussion. And if we start at the resilience of what, I'm thinking about the, the policies that are international and national in nature. So what will it take to push those policies over a threshold that allows them to respond to specific Arctic conditions? Right now, the policies in Bering Strait, as I said, are of global in nature, they don't reflect specific conditions that might involve indigenous food security or involve these levels of concentration of marine mammals that are quite unprecedented. The up to what is the information, is, are they responsive to the changing interaction between vessels, whales and food security as we see vessels impact animals or from a precautionary level as the expectation is that that will happen, do policies respond? And so there's a learning component to this. And one is, as I mentioned before, policy might react to crisis. Um, we might get to a situation where indigenous peoples are no longer able to hunt whales because so many whales are being hit by shipping. Um, that would be a crisis that would need to be in, um, responded to at the IMO or the International Whaling Commission. Or we could be proactive in nature and learn from our experience there elsewhere. There's many analogs around the world um, for marine mammals and particularly in the Atlantic on the things we might do from a precautionary nature learning from elsewhere. Again, a central tenet of resilience thinking. Um, and also from an indigenous perspective, there's models, not as many of them, um, but places like Torres Strait in between Australia and Papua New Guinea offer some examples of things we might do from an indigenous perspective. And where we fit within those two reactive versus proactive really get to this idea of resilience. How much can we take a resilience approach moving forward from here? One that responds to this dynamic, complex environment at multiple scales. 
and I put in the adaptive capacity component there, is with that learning, these are the sort of things that we can do. We can look at things, the speed of vessels, the routing of vessels, the noise vessels make. We can think about pollution, these things that would impact that environment, and those being the policy tools that are relevant at the international or the national level. And with that, that is the background to this study. That's where we're going, and I'm hoping that it's given you what you need to, to understand the, the basic bookends of this case study. Thank you very much.